Today, we are visiting the Fort Tabor Fort Rodman Military Museum in New Bedford, located just 27 miles to the OCHM southeast. Fort Tabor, or the Fort at Clarks Point, is a historic Civil War era military fort that is now part of the city's Fort Tabor Park. Also within the park is the Fort Tabor Fort Rodman Military Museum, which displays donated artifacts from throughout American military history. Many of the museum's volunteers are veterans and retired military personnel who provide interesting and informative tours of the museum year-round. The Fort Tabor Fort Rodman Military Museum is dedicated to sharing the stories of the men and women of New Bedford who have dedicated their lives to service. The War of 1812 taught us that we needed to guard, uh, better guard our uh, deep water ports like Boston, New York. So the art, our artillery board was formed and they met in Boston and decided that yes, New Bedford, Deepwater Harbor needed better protection as did Boston and forts up and down the East Coast were uh, laid out, uh, determined who was gonna have, a, you know, like Portland, Maine, the major ports. And so US Congress then allowed money to be uh, allocated to building of forts. Up to that time, uh, defense of the coast was really uh, the purview of each state. But here you have for the first time, the United States of America deciding to uh, defend their coastline. And New Bedford was chosen as a deep water port, the whaling industry, as a critical port for defense. And uh, based upon the French uh, system of fortifications and how to build a fort, uh, this, this fort here, Fort Rodman, was a part of uh, that decision to build forts up and down the East Coast. So the money didn't really get allocated uh, until the late for, uh, 1840s. Uh, and now uh, along comes the uh, Civil War in 1860, 61, the election in 1860. And uh, Congress said, well, we better start, we start, better start getting this fort built. Well, then, of course, uh, we built a, an earthen uh, uh, fort, to, called it Fort Tabor, mounted some guns. But meanwhile, then get, granite starts to arrive to build a two uh, and three tier uh, casement, casement style of fort based upon French designs. And so you have the Civil War as the impetus that uh, gets this fort uh, started. Uh, so 1861, 1865, the fort is two levels are completed. The fort, uh, the Civil War ends, so does the building of the the fort, it, it stops at the second level that you see today. So uh, the Civil War was the uh, impetus that, that started the uh, building of the fort. But then later, after the Civil War is over, the, uh, the, the city of New Bedford turns this area into a park. But you do have uh, the Fort uh, Rodman here, or what is called the Stone Fort at Clark's Point wasn't really named Fort Rodman until 1898, named for a Colonel Rodman, <clears throat> who died during the Civil War uh, in Louisiana, leading uh, a Massachusetts regiment. So uh, along comes World War I, uh, the Fort Rodman is reactivated, Our artillery is brought in here, uh, new batteries are constructed, uh, it is to be designed to guard Buzzards Bay uh, uh, from German uh, World War I uh, U-boats. Uh, World War II ends, the fort reverts back to a park-like setting, uh, but along comes World War II. And uh, now the Fort Robin really uh, expands the buildings. Uh, a couple of thousand troops are here. And again, guarding uh, uh, Buzzards Bay in the entrance to the Cape Cod Canal. And uh, this was the uh, kind of the headquarters for artillery units, uh, 
that are based or, or I'm sorry, not are, this is a, artillery units are based here, but the uh, directional finding of what the coast watching is spread out all around the area, not uh, Gooseberry Neck, uh, West Island, Island uh, Nashon Point, uh, Cuddy Hunk. And they could uh, <clears throat> triangulate uh, what they would see as a maybe a, a World War or a German enemy submarine. And they could launch uh, artillery shells in that direction. Uh, actually, the batteries here could throw an artillery shell probably up to 23, 24 miles. So it's, it was quite a defensive system that was built here. We also had uh, floating torpedoes here that strung out across the uh, entrance to the harbor. Again, World War II. After World War II, Bill, you're going to have to help me out. Okay. After World War II, it stays an active military installation. Uh, it continues on, uh, especially with the Army Reserve. The Army Reserve actually stays here uh, full full-time Army Reserves stay here until 1990. Yes. And that's when they finally, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, or the Iron Curtain, as it's called, that's when they removed the, the soldiers from here. Where we're standing right here, right now, where this building is right now, used to be actually a motor pool where they stored trucks. And it used to be pavement. They added all the dirt on top of it and put placed the building here. So this was an active fort all during the 60s and 70s. My name is Jack Burns. I'm a volunteer at the Fort Tabor Fort Rodman Military Museum in New Bedford. And um, we are actually glad to be able to show and exhibit a Medal of Honor in our museum. And we have the Medal of Honor here on display that was actually won by this gentleman, William Downey. And he won it in conjunction with two other men whose names are on this board. That would be David Gifford and John Duffy. And they were all in the Massachusetts 4th Cavalry. This is in May of 1864, and they were stationed at Hilton Head, South Carolina. They received the assignment to proceed up the Ashapoo River um, to burn a railroad trestle that was still supplying Charleston, South Carolina, for the Confederacy. So they boarded the steamboat Boston and the, uh, with some 400 black soldiers, or United States colored troops, as they called them at the time. They were to proceed up the river to burn this railroad trestle. They had to hire a local pilot as they were unfamiliar with the river's depths and its currents. We believe that he was probably a Confederate sympathizer. He missed the spot he was supposed to drop them off at, and he managed to run the Boston aground 300 yards from a Confederate battery. The battery began to shell the Boston. The soldiers who were on the Boston, they were all new to the Army, many of them, and um, many of them couldn't swim. They were all totally panicking. So they, they decided they had to form a boat crew that would boat row back and forth, back and forth, on a boat that was still attached to the back of the Boston in hopes of evacuating the Boston. And that's what they did. These three men, one other enlisted man, and this gentleman on the, the far left over here, uh, Lieutenant George Brush at the time, he was an officer with the United States Colored Troops. They formed a five-man boat crew and they made multiple trips back and forth and evacuated some 400 soldiers from the Boston. And for that they were recognized and received their medals, however not until 1897. <clears throat> there was a commission in Washington DC in the 1890s formed to recognize feats of valor and heroism that had been overlooked during the war and that's why there was some delay in them receiving their medals. All this material that we have available here um, was donated by Downey's family some five years ago. So we have his actual medal, we have his funeral bill, his button hook, his mustache comb, 
his discharge papers. And when Downey served, he was a uh, he was not a U.S. citizen. He had emigrated to this country from Ireland, and he joined the Union Army from Fall River. But in 1867, after the war, he received his citizenship. Here in New Bedford, we also like to recognize William H. Carney. He is considered the first African American to receive the Medal of Honor. He was enlisted in the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. <clears throat> they were the first all-black regiment being recruited here in the North. And Carney's personal story is that he was, in 1863, he was 23 years old, living up here in New Bedford with his father. In then they could take the black soldiers in the army, and he enlisted in March of 1863. He went off with the Mass 54th. They trained up at Reedville near Boston. And in May and June of 1863, they shipped out for South Carolina and Georgia. They had some activity down there. Um, probably most notably, they burnt the town of Darien, Georgia. However, many of the jobs that they were given were kind of a menial nature. They appealed to their commander, Robert Gould Shaw, if they could be more involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the regiment. And yes, they were. They received the assignment to be the lead regiment on the attack on Fort Wagner or Battery Wagner on an island in Charleston, South Carolina Harbor. The way this went, um, they received tremendous casualties. However, what happened, um, Carney was now a sergeant. He's following the flag bearer. The flag bearer gets shot. Carney snatches the flag up and proceeds to the parapet of the fort. He plants the fort, but he's there practically alone. All the others had been wounded or killed around him. They had to withdraw. In the withdrawal, Carney got wounded. He got wounded about six times that day. When they got behind the lines, they wanted to treat his wounds. He did not want to give up the flag to anyone who had not been a member of the Mass 54th. Finally, he passed out from a loss of blood. That's how they got the flag away from him. Um, his personal story, they, they treated his wounds. He was honorably discharged in 1864, came back to New Bedford, had a number of jobs with the city. He was involved with the lamp lighting at the city streets at night. <clears throat> he was very active with the Grand Army of the Republic, the Veterans Group for Civil War Veterans. In 1900, he was a mailman, a mail carrier here in New Bedford, and he actually delivered the Medal of Honor to himself. What you can see here are various examples of what's known as trench art. These are actually shell casings that were carved and formed by soldiers when they had some spare time. As you can see, a lot of them are very intricate designs. A lot of these men had no formal art training, but it's amazing what they could produce. It's almost like Scrimshaw transferred to metal. Here's an example of a Corsair plane that was also carved out of a whole artillery shell. Even the propeller works. And we have a trench art lamp complete with a helmet. Over here, a couple more examples. all done by men in their spare time. One more example here is a lamp with um, some deactivated bullets. But it, it's really a testament to the skill of some of these soldiers that they had during the war.
here is the <clears throat> restored Mark 28 torpedo. It's a submarine launch passive acoustic torpedo that was designed by Westinghouse Electric back in 1944 during World War II. In actuality, it was a <clears throat> redesign of a captured German torpedo that had a designation of G7E. And the reason Westinghouse redesigned it for the Navy is that this being a passive acoustic torpedo, you have to listen to target noise to acquire the target. And the German torpedo was a very noisy torpedo. It had two propellers instead of one, and it had mechanical linkage to the ailerons to control it. So what Westinghouse did is they converted it to a total electric torpedo. It has an electric motor, it has electric controls. So by doing that, it reduced the noise significantly. Now, this torpedo, like I mentioned, being a passive acoustic, it has four hydrophones and a nose cone of the torpedo, two in the horizontal plane and two in the vertical plane. And what that does, it listens for target noise. It could pick up noise, engine noise, or prop cavitation noise, or crew noise, you know. And once it is able to determine what direction the noise is coming from, it would home in on the, on the target. And this has a contact exploder. It has to make contact with the hull or propeller or the rudder to explode the warhead, which would have been a four foot section in the back of the cone here. This doesn't have a, does not have a warhead on it. The warhead would be a four foot section containing 585 pounds of high explosive uh, HBX, which is high blast explosion. And once it made contact and it exploded, then you'd, you'd have a successful hit. Now the Navy also has magnetic exploders. And with a magnetic exploder, the torpedo was set at the wrong running depth and went underneath the hull the change in magnetism would affect the warhead and it would explode. It didn't, you wouldn't have to make a direct contact. Now this torpedo, there was 1,750 produced from 1944 to 1952 and it was in service for the Navy till 1960. And uh, once the Navy developed the Mark 37 torpedo, this was taken out of service. The Mark 37 was a wire-guided torpedo. And uh, the difference between a, this torpedo and a wire-guided torpedo is that if you have a wire-guided torpedo, you can send commands to the torpedo after it leaves the ship. Once this torpedo left the ship, you had no control over it at all. It was on its own. With the wire guide, you could control the, the gyro angle that the torpedo was set. You could uh, control the running depth, you can change the depth. If the sonar men on the submarine detected that the target had changed depth, they could send a signal over the wire to change the torpedo depth. Also the running depth, the distance the torpedo is run out before it enables uh, could be changed. So that's basically uh, a quick rundown as to how this operates and the little history behind it. The story we're going to talk about today is the story of the tragedy of Exercise Tiger. This uh, event occurred on the night of April 28th, 1944. Uh, the genesis of this story really begins in 43, 
when uh, General Eisenhower, the commanding general of the Allied Forces, uh, Supreme Headquarters Expeditionary Allied Force, that's going to make that landing at D-Day, Normandy, France. Uh, general Eisenhower determined that more practice was needed for a successful landing at D-Day Exercise Tiger than was a part of the uh, dress rehearsals leading up to D-Day, June 1944. The story here is simply this. Uh, the uh, Army was not uh, trained to do amphibious landings. That really was the uh, area for the U.S. Marines. Uh, the Army troops filing into or being brought into England for the D-Day landings uh, really had no experience in amphibious landings. They had six weeks of basic training another six weeks of maybe advanced infantry training. They were put on ships, convoyed over to England, uh, taken by train to southern England, and that is where the buildup uh, began uh, for D-Day landings. And General Eisenhower then ordered up uh, a series of uh, uh, practice exercises. Uh, Exercise Tiger was simply one of those. And uh, this exercise involved uh, learning how to load ships in the proper order and how to offload in the proper order on beaches. Uh, a, a successful beach landing uh, really takes place in waves. First wave, infantry. Uh, second wave, more infantry. Third wave then becomes first aid. Uh, uh, bullets, uh, petroleum, uh, and service uh, personnel, truck drivers. Exercise Tiger involved service personnel, and they were uh, loaded onto a convoy of eight or nine LSTs. LST stands for Landing Ship Tank. Uh, they were uh, uh, taken out into uh, Lime Bay in, uh, near Devon, England. This simulated very closely Utah Beach. That's why this area was selected. Well, on the night of the 27th of April, 1944, they are out in uh, Lime Bay simulating a crossing, cross-channel crossing to France. So they're going at a very slow pace in line. <clears throat> Unbeknownst to them, the, a German uh, group of PT boats called Schnell boats, each with four, four torpedoes on board, got into the middle of the convoy at 1 a.m. on the 28th of April. And they fired their first round uh, at uh, LST 507. And in 20 minutes, that ship went down. They fired a second round of torpedoes, and LST-531 uh, went down. Went down in six minutes. On board each of these LSTs were about 350 Army personnel. Well, now, <clears throat> it's nighttime. Water was about 41 degrees temperature, and uh, chaos resulted. Fuel from all the trucks on board these ships lit up the ocean. And so these poor fellows uh, are out there swimming uh, in burning water. <clears throat> the loss was 749 Navy and Army personnel that night. Well, <clears throat> this uh, put in jeopardy uh, the D-Day landing timetable. Uh, General Eisenhower didn't want the uh, uh, German High Command to know when and where, of course, the D-Day landings were to take place. So a blackout was ordered. No one could talk about this tragedy. The blackout order was never lifted. So <clears throat> the story then uh, continues on. Uh, 749 perished that night. Actually, on Utah Beach, only 300 lost their lives. So more lost their lives in practice dress rehearsal 
in April than happened at, on D-Day in June. So, the story continues on. A fellow by the name of Ken Small, uh, a uh, fellow who bought a bed and breakfast in the uh, Devon, England area, walking the beach, starts to find memorabilia, buckles, uh, buttons, whatever, from military wonders what is this all about? He discovers that from the locals that indeed uh, practice landings had taken place at Slapton Sands. He also finds uh, from the locals, finds the information that there is a, a sunken American tank out in the bay, an M4 Sherman tank. He takes it upon himself to purchase that tank from the U.S. Army, U.S. government. And he floats, he finds a firm, they float the tank ashore. And you can see here in the photos, that is a memorial at Slapton Sands of a U.S. Army tank, memorializing the tragedy at Slapton Sands, the 28th of April, 1944. And so here at this museum, we memorialized uh, the exercise tiger Outside this museum, you'll see an M4 Sherman tank. That is also a memorial to Exercise Tiger. It is a twin to the one that's in England. And so here we have a display showing some of the memorabilia and artifacts from Exercise Tiger. And we have displayed here all the names of the servicemen that died that evening. the citizens of New Bedford, the sons and daughters uh, that went off to the wars that you see on the walls here, their, their photos. Uh, we're, we're educating the, today's population of New Bedford with their sons and daughters uh, who preceded them and went to war to defend our country. And I would say one thing, it's not only just the war, it's the people who gave their lives for service. Okay, we've had a lot of people during the period of time when there wasn't a war, but they gave their time and effort to stand out there and tell people, you know, we'll stand between you and the bad guys. Basic and simple. 